On the cusp of the new millennium, an eerie anxiety permeates our culture regarding the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Surveys show that a third of all Americans believe in UFOs. Nearly five million claim they have encountered alien beings. Scientists remind us that these fantastic sightings are unconfirmed and unconfirmable. Skeptics insist that the people who make these claims are either deluded or they're exploiting the controversy for personal gain. And yet, the people who say they've had these experiences remain loyal to their stories. Stories which capture our attention and reflect a deep hunger to believe that we are not alone. In rural Kentucky, a man recalls his family's supposed shotgun battle with aliens in 1955. A UFO investigator describes what she believes to be a face-to-face -face encounter with an alien. Just a mile from New York City, dozens of people hold the stories of UFOs and extraterrestrial visitations in a public park. And finally, a biblical scholar explains his belief that 6,000 years ago, all of human civilization was influenced by visitors from outer space. The notion of extraterrestrial life, fact or fiction? Or can it only be described as unexplained? In 1955, Kelly, Kentucky, 70 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee, was a peaceful farming community. On the evening of August 21st, deep in the Kelly countryside, a party of 10 people reported a wild encounter with aliens. The Langfords were winding down from a family get-together, filled with laughter and card playing. 12 years old at the time, Lonnie Langford says he remembers that night clearly. There was me, my brother, my sister, two half-brothers, their wives, and a friend and his wife. And that's about it, besides my mother. And we just sat around, you know, and talked and played cards. And my half-brother's friend, Taylor, he had to go out. You know, we didn't have no uh, inside restrooms back then. And uh, as he was going out the door, he looked up and he noticed this uh, round object. It had lights all around it. The Langford's guest raced inside to tell the others what he had seen. They all thought he was joking. The card playing went on uninterrupted. Finally, everyone turned in for the night, everyone except Lonnie's mother. She was just laying there awake with her eyes open and looking out the uh, living room window and uh, I saw this uh, little uh, this object standing there. She screamed, you know. Everyone jumped out of bed and Lonnie's brothers grabbed their shotguns. He saw uh, little creatures Three foot tall, well feet, well ears, big eyes, hands that were well shaped like. They were silver, had silver uniforms. No noise, no sound, no talking. They was just there. I don't know why. Lonnie and his family watched the creatures float through the air as his brothers fired their shotguns. They say some bullets knocked the aliens over, but that to everyone's horror, the strange beings got back up again, unscathed. Everybody got roused up, started hollering and screaming. Lonnie's brother headed outside with his shotgun. Just as he was going outside, one of them grabbed him by the hair of the head, and then he jumped on out in the yard and, you know, shot at him. Lonnie Langford said he and his family watched in terror as these glowing beings circled their home. When his brothers finally ran out of ammunition, they brandished their flashlights. The beams illuminated the sky. And to the family's surprise, the silver creatures quickly retreated into the darkness. They weren't trying to hurt nobody. They weren't, they weren't trying to hurt a soul. I think they was more scared of us than we were of them. <laughs> you know, but I was, I was really scared. You know, and I'm just telling you the truth. Is Lonnie Langford telling the truth? Or is his story nothing more than a twisted memory from a family gathering gone awry? What we do know is that on the same evening, other residents in the area had reported what they believed to be meteor sightings.
accompanied by a strange, machine-like hum. When the Langfords reported their sighting, police officers, state troopers, and even soldiers from the nearby Fort Campbell Army base arrived to check it out. Kentucky State Trooper Russell Ferguson investigated the incident. He found no physical evidence to substantiate the Langford story. The only thing that we did find was the family there, uh, rather disturbed, uh, very emotional, and swearing that something had occurred in the way of small, silver-looking people with big eyes and big heads trying to get into their house. UFO investigator Philip Imbrogno finds the Langford family's story compelling. He thinks they may indeed have encountered extraterrestrials. It is one of the cases that is actually very convincing. Because here you have a family that really didn't care anything about UFOs, and all of a sudden they report that they had these little beings coming on their property and they fire it on them and so on. And to this day, that is one of the cases that convinced me that perhaps we should consider that there are extraterrestrials here from time to time that have landed on our planet and interacted with our society. During the time of the Langford sighting in the mid-50s, Americans of all walks of life were enthralled with space age images and a new wave of science fiction movies was coming out of Hollywood, many of which were based on the growing anxieties surrounding the Cold War. The local people were influenced by movies and books and magazine articles popular in that particular time, but keep in mind that the people of this area were fundamentally agricultural in background and Protestant in their faith, with some commitment to the fundamental side of faith. Since the Langfords claim to be devout Christians, is it possible that they had become overzealous from a religious revival meeting that Sunday afternoon? State Trooper Russell Ferguson doesn't think so. He believes they were drunk. I didn't find anything up there except just a bunch of people running amok. They had one specific uh, emotion, <laughs> and that's from, a, I think, a pretty wild day. Oh, there was no alcohol there. No alcohol at all, because my mom, she was real Christian and she wasn't allowed in the house. My brothers did drink, you know, but they didn't, they didn't have anything around the house. There was no alcohol around the house that night. Another explanation for what took place that night involves a traveling circus, which happened to be passing through town. I went to our newspaper files and found the uh, show, showing of the Shrine Circus here at our fairgrounds for three nights, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, prior to this activity at Kelly. It's certainly possible that monkeys were in that traveling troop of the Shrine Circus, and it is possible that some of them could have escaped. Some people said it was monkeys from the circus. I didn't know that there was a circus at the time, and neither did my family. There ain't no silver monkeys. How can a monkey be silver? If these strange visions weren't brought on by excessive drinking or playful chimpanzees, what really happened? One author on paranormal phenomena, Greg Little, thinks there could be a scientific explanation. This part of Kentucky lies on a major fault line. Little points out that tectonic pressures in the Earth can create unusual forms of electromagnetic discharge strong enough to disorient people. These electromagnetic plasmas have this enormous, powerful electromagnetic field around them. And when a person gets close to this field, it does interact with brain biochemistry. It also produces serotonin, a substance that is biochemically identical to a hallucinogenic drug called dimethyltryptamine, which is a 30-minute LSD trip, which, gee, if you had a 30-minute LSD trip when you were asleep, what would we call that? A dream. Dreams, nightmares, few, if any, will ever be sure of exactly what happened that summer night in 1955. I have no idea why the aliens visit me. Maybe they're just passing over and something and got curious and wanted to come down. I don't have no idea. And why do you think God put all those other planets out there and all those moons and all those other suns and just left this one with life on it? 
all the rest of them out there is without life now. I ask you, if you were suddenly capable of going from here to uh, Mars or uh, the sun or whatever other planet, and you were coming to Earth with all that technology that was available to you, now surely to hell you wouldn't land in Kelly, Kentucky when we've got the nation's capital and all the other big cities and what have you. No, I don't think so. One thing is certain. Lonnie Langford and his family did not go out seeking extraterrestrials that August evening. And the memory has haunted them ever since. There are areas around the world which are known as so-called UFO hotspots because of the frequency of reported sightings. Pine Bush, in upstate New York is one of those places. That is what attracted UFO investigator Ellen Crystal. This is where she actively attempts to initiate contact with aliens. Having written a book on her experiences called Silent Invasion, she believes her 20 years of research, including over 1,000 photographs, offers evidence of the existence of extraterrestrial life. It really takes a certain mentality um, to do it in, in a, co uh, a cohesive um, way so that you, you come away with some research. I mean, there's uh, people like me trying to collect research and successfully doing it and trying to have close encounters where you can use equipment and machinery that actually works and registers. Ellen first began searching for extraterrestrials in the countryside around Pine Bush during the early 1980s. At that time, a psychic told her that she had been cured by aliens during a severe childhood illness. She basically did a, a reading uh, with me and she said, um, when you were four, you were really sick. And she said, I see the ship above a white house and they healed you. And I said, well, I was sick. I was sick for eight months. I thought I was two. This psychic reading motivated Ellen to pursue her dream of meeting up with aliens. This is her story. She maintains that on August 7th, 1980, she had a close encounter which satisfied her curiosity, perhaps more fully than she had expected. My own stipulation was that I would not walk in a new field that, that I hadn't walked in already. So um, I had gone up to actually uh, the first site, which is right up here, uh, about half a mile. And I was standing in the field, and I was turning around, just watching some nebulous lights. I saw a huge uh, bright light go down in the trees right across the street from me. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I kind of thought they were daring me. Ellen took the challenge. She drove from field to field, contemplating her next move. Gathering up her courage, she went back to the spot where she had first seen the mysterious lights. She says that as she aimed her flashlight up into the trees, she saw something that looked like a moth. But when she moved the light down, she saw legs. Legs that appeared to run in place. But the thing ran across the clearing when it could have ducked into any bush. This, this was the other thing that, that puzzled me. It ran across the clearing, came to the edge of the clearing, stopped and stared at me. The alien in pine bush was about three and a half feet tall. Um, no discernible clothing, beige, uh, very pale beige looking, very thin, uh, large head, no hair, um, very big yellow eyes uh, that wrapped around to the side and, and the eyes were what uh, caught in my flashlight. Ellen was bewildered by an overwhelming power, which she sensed radiating from the creature. I mean, they, they look, if you just look at somebody that size, you think nothing, like a child. But then you get this awesome feeling of, of power. And at that point, I probably decided to take off. That was probably one of the deciding factors. Frightened and exhausted, she drove to a deserted parking lot to rest and collect her thoughts. I just couldn't deal with all the emotion. I was so paralyzed with fear, and I, I, I remember my chest like going up and down. I, I mean, I was totally panic-stricken. I started to sweat. 
Ellen Crystal kept a journal of this and other experiences that she included in her book. As part of her research, she has developed elaborate theories all her own about why these aliens have come to Earth. I think that the aliens have a problem. I think they have a really terminal physical problem. I think the only reason that aliens would be coming here on such a massive level would be if they have a terminal physical problem and that essentially equates to reproduction, that they may, may be a race on the edge of extinction. Are Ellen Crystal's claims of extraterrestrial incursions into upstate New York to be believed? Or is she subscribing to a type of modern-day mythology? Professor of Sociology at Northwestern University, Bernard Beck, thinks this is the case. There are some people who are saying, when the extraterrestrials come, they are so smart and so accomplished just by virtue of the fact that they got here, that they'll bring with them all sorts of things to make our lives better, they'll take care of us. And like anything that is created by ordinary people in their masses, through culture, through talking over back fences and talking over lunch and talking over a beer at a bar, it creates a culture, expectations, and a sense of the way these things are supposed to go. According to fellow UFO investigator Philip Imbrogno, Ellen's expectations are so intense that combined with her apparent fascination with science fiction, her objectivity is severely compromised. I believe that Ellen Crystal um, is very sincere about what she's doing. I question some of her methods of investigation and some of her conclusions as to what she is collecting. When she looks at her evidence, she says this can be nothing else but ETs. Okay? When I look at her evidence, I say, well, you've got something here. Uh, there are a lot of unexplainable sightings, but I don't think she has enough evidence to actually put a label on it to say this is an extraterrestrial spaceship. Many of the UFO sightings in Hudson Valley occur around the Stewart International Airport near Pine Bush. Airport manager and retired air traffic controller Ken No is familiar with these claims. People can see meteors, which are pretty spectacular sights sometimes. Most of the sightings that I've heard of are in the evening, and various airplanes have different kinds of lights, different configurations of lights, and if people aren't looking at the night sky all the time, or a great deal of the time, they may find something unusual looking. Adding to the confusion, in the summer of 1988, during a rash of reported UFO sightings, a group of pilots decided to play a practical joke on the residents of the Hudson Valley. They flew in an echelon formation, or if you like, a V formation, in small light aircraft, which don't make a great deal of noise, and they looked pretty impressive. And so it was quite an impressive sight. And a number of people reported that as a, a UFO, which probably was the pilot's intention in the first place, to have some fun with folks. It caused quite a stir for a number of years. Ken No and other local air traffic controllers remain skeptical of Ellen Crystal's conclusions and of her UFO video research. I have seen some of her work, some of her photographs, um, and I think they're certainly questionable. These tapes were shot near the Stewart International Airport. Clearly looks like an airplane to me. Um, I see flashing strobe lights as anti-collision lights and what may be two landing lights on uh, the wingtips of the aircraft. Again, this, this clearly looks to me like a slightly out of focus uh, video of an aircraft. I think you can clearly see this is a, probably a large jet aircraft. At this point on the tape, you can even hear the engines. Looks like an airplane to me. Ellen's photographs fail to hold up under any scientific scrutiny. Another problem is that her reported sightings tend to take place when she is alone. Psychology professor Hubert Dolezal says that when Ellen's psychic told her that aliens had cured her during a childhood illness, it may have caused these delusional sightings. I'm sure people talked, the family probably mourned, cried, uh, she was probably told she might die or chances are she perceived that and picked up on it. And then she's told that someone out of the ordinary, someone out of the medical community is responsible for her healing, perhaps the most important event in her life. She has life. Psychologically, I liken this with someone who finds out uh, somewhat later in life that he or she was adopted. 
and the terrific human need to make contact. Many UFO sightings are easily explained. Yet when more than one person claims to see the same object at the same time from different vantage points, the reports become harder to dismiss. Hudson County, New Jersey, the town of North Bergen, a middle-class suburb across the river from New York City. Its residents are hardworking, educated professionals who tend to be realists. This is also a place where there have been persistent claims of alien and UFO sightings. George Obarski owned a Manhattan liquor store and drove the same route back to his home in North Bergen, New Jersey, every night for decades. At 3 a.m. on the morning of January 12, 1975, as he was driving through the local park, his radio reception suddenly became distorted. He related the subsequent events to UFO investigator Bud Hopkins, who recorded his story with a portable tape recorder. Well, I would say that that thing was 30 feet across. Mm -hmm. It was a big thing. Yeah. And uh, it, it seemed to be, I would say, maybe six feet high. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like a pancake. Yeah. It was blown up in the, yeah. like, a, like a pancake. Right. And, and the thing landed right ahead of me. He described small figures who got out. He said they looked like kids in snowsuits. And they were each one carrying a kind of a, a squarish uh, receptacle and a long spoon-like shovel. They dug soil samples extremely quickly, spooning up the dirt, put it in the little satchels and got back in the craft. He said they moved incredibly fast, like kids coming down a fire escape. And the thing took off. He was absolutely terrified, stunned. He didn't know what he was seeing. Even after George Obarski made it home, he was still shaken, terrorized by what he had encountered. I was scared to death. Yeah. You know, I was, I was sweating. And I immediately made some tea. Boy, after that, I turned on this radio and took two aspirins. You know, I was, I was scared. Right. Man, it just either I'm going crazy or something awful wrong with me. George Obarski died in 1990. His son, Frank, remembers his father's story well. What he described was a, a big saucer-like uh, object, which for want of any better explanation, you'd have to call a UFO, unidentified flying object, that came down, was sort of disc-like on the bottom, had very strange lighting, sort of glowed. The clincher was after it landed, my father, described himself as being basically frozen, almost in fear. And this is a guy who'd been robbed a lot in the liquor store in New York and knew what fear was like and had coped with it a lot. But he, was, he said he was genuinely frightened of this thing. Bud Hopkins tried to corroborate George Obarski's story with other witnesses, including a doorman who worked at the Stonehenge apartment building across the street from the park. I realized it was a big apartment building there. So I spent weeks trying to locate the doorman. I called him and I remember my <laughs> adrenaline rushing when this man said, I will never forget it. This flying saucer came down and landed in the park and I watched the thing come down. Then he started describing what it looked like and it was a, an identical description to George. After writing about Obarski's story in the Village Voice newspaper, Bud Hopkins kept looking for other possible witnesses. One family came to light afterwards. They were living about five blocks away, seeing this object coming down the street, maybe uh, 40 feet up, slanted. And they described it as if it was looking in their windows. Uh, and even though the woman in the family was ill, um, she, she ran outside in her nightgown, bare feet, and uh, the father and the children ran out, and they followed this thing down the street. A North Bergen school teacher, Ann Karlovich, says she listened skeptically as her daughters described the telltale evidence in the park on the day after the alleged incident. Back in 1975, uh, we had heard about this incident that there was a, a flying saucer in the park. So my daughter and her friends went down to the park to see what was going on and they all came running back saying they saw rings and burn marks in the grass uh, in the field down near the softball field. And uh, they told me the whole story about broken windows, that the Stonehenge had a large glass facade and it was broken by a beam of light that hit it. The kids were awfully excited about it.
Frank Obarski also went to the site with his father. He knew him as a practical man, so it was difficult for him to understand why his dad held to such a seemingly irrational story. He didn't show much interest in things that couldn't be proved or disproved or that didn't apply to everyday life. And this was one of those categories that he felt didn't apply to everyday life. So I had a lot of trouble reconciling my knowledge of my father with this story he was telling me. He said, uh, you know, I've lived a long life as honorably and truthfully as I was able to. And he said, a man doesn't do that for over 70 years and then throw it all away by making up some foolishness. Since the alleged sighting made famous by George Obarski in 1975, residents of North Bergen, New Jersey, have reported seeing dozens of UFOs on a number of different occasions. In the early evening of July 6, 1986, Wall Street investor Ron Lee and artist Nanetta Nappi were enjoying the sunset on her terrace in the Stonehenge apartment complex. I just said, what the heck is that out in the sky? I was just staring out and I saw something that was unidentifiable to me. And Nanetta and I looked at it and it wasn't moving. It didn't have any sound. And we just followed it with our eyes and tried to guess what, what that could be. Had it had a motor sound to it, I would not have been suspicious. But the fact that it was so silent and large, it was a large shaped object, it drew my attention even further. I might have just ignored it. It was oval and it had two three sets of lights underneath it. And it just kept stationary in the sky for five, ten minutes. And then at some point, it just took off and went south in a fashion without gaining momentum, but just going straight off with uh, accelerated speed uh, beyond what I was used to seeing. And shortly after that, very shortly, we saw, we heard noise and, and then saw military aircraft following it. The next day, sightings of this UFO were reported in the press. Nanetta was not one of the people who had called the local officials. Now you don't want to talk about things that people could think that you're a little strange thinking about it. I was in denial about it because um, I didn't want to accept or believe um, that this thing was, um, did not have a rational reason behind it. Two years later, in the same area of New Jersey, disc jockey Dave D'Elia claims he witnessed an unidentified flying object on St. Patrick's Day in 1988 over North Hudson Park. D'Elia says he was driving home when he noticed something in the sky. He pulled over. As I'm standing there, it's getting closer and closer. No noise at all. But the lights that made up the triangle were white. I mean, the, the diamond were white and green. D'Elia returned to his car and followed the UFO down the parkway for several miles, noting the shape of the craft. The shape of the UFO was a diamond shape like this. Where my thumbs are was basically the part that was coming toward me. That's how it was flying. In 1993, five years after D'Elia's reported 1988 sighting, another North Bergen resident, Ann Karlovich, who had been skeptical of the earlier Obarski sighting, claimed she, too, was an eyewitness to an unidentified flying object. I saw this very kind of a elliptical-shaped large light shining, and I looked at it, and I said, gee, wow, what is that? And it, was, it seemed to be moving very slowly, but I wasn't sure. And then as I turned my car around, it was gone. So um, I came into the house, and my son-in-law and daughter were here, and I said to Joe, my son-in-law, I said, wow, did I see something strange on Boulevard East? And he said, I saw it too. It had a uh, sort of eerie glow. It looked uh, metallic and was, was very well lit, like with a, a fluorescent, bright um, flood kind of light. As I recall it to be a, a blimp-like object, uh, like an elongate, like an ellipse, you know, elliptical sphere, if you will. Joe Bass remembers reading the next day in the local newspaper that all the blimps in the area had been grounded due to foggy weather. I know that it wasn't. I know that it wasn't some sort of uh, uh, 
lights on the clouds or a meteor or anything like that. I suspect it was either some kind of government aircraft, some Air Force kind of aircraft that they don't let on that they have an aircraft of this type. It wasn't a plane, it wasn't a helicopter, it was like a, a blimp type object. It is quite clear that people in this area believe they are seeing UFOs. But are they alien spacecraft? Since World War II, reports of UFO sightings have grown to merit a system of classification, a way to categorize people's claims. This method was developed by an astronomy professor at Northwestern University, J. Allen Hynek. It was he who coined the phrase, close encounter of the third kind, to describe human contact with an alien. Philip Imbrogno collaborated with Hynek on his final book in 1987. They collected accounts of East Coast sightings, which Imbrogno says number into the thousands. As I began to investigate more cases, I began to realize that I was just touching the tip of the iceberg. Actually, over in a period of five years, there were 7,000 sightings. Now, they were made by people who are pillars in the community, police officers, pilots, lawyers, educators, scientists, executives for major corporations, all saw an object that they considered to be larger than a football field flying overhead. Psychologist Hubert Dolezal maintains that UFO believers are mistaken in what they think they are seeing. What we're looking at is a perceptual phenomenon where the background information is either dark conditions or dust conditions, and where there's very little visual structure against which the object appears. Add to that the question of, does this person have myopia, nearsightedness, and astigmatism, uh, suffers from any other kind of visual defect, and now you're looking at the question of not only unidentified uh, moving objects, but unidentified stationary objects. I know what I saw. That's the only thing I can say. I know I saw something that didn't look like anything else I had seen before. Syndicated columnist Sally Deering grew up in the North Bergen area. She's heard dozens of the local UFO stories, and she thinks any belief in aliens and UFOs is ridiculous. They jumped to UFO. You know, uh, and I think they jumped to that too quickly. You know, there's a lot of ways you could explain a lot of the, these things that we see. And I think that people just want to believe, you know, they'll go from A to alien before they'll go to A to B. And I remember back in the early 70s how we would read books, you know, Robert Heinlein's uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, Kurt Vonnegut's uh, books. And we would accept uh, science fiction as some kind of metaphor for uh, what we were living in at the time. You know, we, uh, this sort of feeling of out being outcast in a society. Are alienated people confusing science fiction with reality? According to Professor Dolezal, those who claim to see aliens and UFOs may be experiencing a psychological need to be a part of a trend, something bigger than themselves, thus latching on to observations which have little or no supporting evidence. What I do believe is going on it's the proverbial bandwagon effect, that it's popular to be included and to be part of this. Uh, it is becoming more and more accepted. The onus of you're nuts or there's something wrong with your brain or uh, you're a liar is, has been vastly decreased. I think people are more open to the possibility. I believe every human being wants to be part of something that is special, that is important, that is exciting. Certainly with the advent of human beings becoming more sophisticated in terms of space travel, our own yearnings to be in space and, and to populate other planets, I think all of that has fueled, and reasonably so, this entire belief system and movement. Although skeptics like Professor Dolezal give compelling reasons why people think they see things which are not really there, Believers remain irritated by the general skepticism they encounter. Frank Obarski is still perplexed by his father's alleged experience. It really bothered him that, that people thought he was lying about this. And that's the thing that I find the most compelling about, about this whole story and the thing that I have the most trouble with. Is I suppose it is frightening because it's the unknown, you know, things that are not really... <sighs> Part of the known are frightening. It just came and went and 
Um, I could be wrong, but I, I think that was really a once in a lifetime event where I saw something that's unexplained. Approximately 6,000 years ago, in southern Mesopotamia, a people known as the Sumerians developed an advanced society. As with the ancient Egyptians, many aspects of Sumerian culture remain cloaked in mystery. Zachariah Sitchin is a biblical scholar and expert on ancient civilizations. He believes that extraterrestrials called the Anunnaki visited this planet and influenced the Sumerian culture, a culture which attained heights that have not been matched until modern times. They had incredible knowledge uh, of the heavens, of astronomy, of mathematics. Uh, they had uh, high-rise buildings. Uh, they uh, were the first to introduce the wheel. They had art, they had music, they had dance, they had laws, they had courts, they had judges, they had kings. Everything that we consider essential to a high civilization appeared there almost overnight 6,000 years ago. Sitchin bases his beliefs about the extraterrestrial influence on the Sumerian myths, which were written on ancient tablets. He contends that these myths describe actual experiences with the extraterrestrials known as the Anunnaki. The following text describes an assignment given to the ancient astronauts. Some were told to orbit and guard the Earth, while others were sent down to settle. Assigned to Anu to heed his instructions, 300 in the heavens he stationed as a guard, the ways of Earth to define from the heaven and on Earth, 600 he made reside. After he all their instructions had ordered to the Anunnaki of heaven and of Earth, he allotted their assignments. I surmise from those various texts uh, they uh, were uh, losing their atmosphere on their planet, whether because of natural causes or ecological developments. According to Sitchin, these texts describe the Anunnaki coming to Earth to acquire gold particles, which they would use to shield their atmosphere. The myths also offer information about law, astronomy, and the cosmos. In these texts, our solar system consists of not nine planets as we know it, but of 12, with the Anunnaki coming from the 12th planet called Nibiru. This mysterious planet comes close to the Earth's orbit every 3,600 years. The evidence from those ancient texts, from those ancient depictions, leaves no doubt in my mind that others from another planet were involved not only in our creation by jumping the gun on evolution, uh, the way the Bible uh, states it, but uh, they were involved in giving us civilization for uh, uh, many uh, millennia thereafter. Did the Sumerians evolve differently from the rest of humanity? Nearly all scholars on Sumerian culture dismiss Sitchin's hypothesis including Professor Miguel Seville of the University of Chicago. In my experience, there is nothing in the evolution of the culture in southern Mesopotamia that cannot be explained by the normal evolution of, of culture in general. Professor Seville maintains that the Sumerian mythological texts are nothing more or less than what they appear to be, myths. He doubts Sitchin's ability to accurately translate these texts. The author mixes languages and explains one form of a language by another. And sometimes he seems almost incapable of recognizing whether a, a, a word is Sumerian, Akkadian, or Hebrew. Not only do scholars of cultural anthropology like Professor Seville differ with Sitchin's 12th planet theory, there are astronomers who argue against its very premise. I don't think that such a planet would be able to elude our detection for any real length of time, uh, given what we are able to do now um, as far as uh, telescopic observations and gravitational studies and so forth. As far as uh, traveling here, I personally don't see any reason why uh, our particular star system would be any more interesting than any other. Of course, new planets are still being discovered. And NASA experts have recently made claims of microfossils on Mars. 
These findings have led most natural scientists to concede that there is a distinct possibility of life evolving elsewhere in the cosmos. My guess is that if life forms, it forms on the surface of the planet. You have to have a certain temperate climate. You have to have water on the surface or water just below the surface. It's possible that some of these precursors for life, the organic molecules, get seeded onto, the, onto primitive Earth, say through comets. We know that comets have a lot of organic chemistry going on in them. Many astronomers and astrophysicists agree with Professor Novick. And yet if there is advanced life elsewhere in the heavens, even in possession of sophisticated technology, the distances involved in navigating the stars are simply too vast. Maybe there are 10 advanced civilizations in our galaxy, maybe. But if there are, and this is really far-fetched, if there are, they are so far away from us that there is no chance. They are hundreds of thousands of light years away. There is no chance, zero, that we will ever be visited. The best way to describe um, the distance to the stars, the distances are actually quite, quite fast. Um, the distance from here to the galactic center, we're just talking roughly 30,000 or so light years, I believe. There are those that maintain that the current surge in extraterrestrial sightings is best explained as a substitute for traditional religion. If you take an adherence to a divine being, a god, what a religious belief one may want to adhere to. In the absence of such a religious belief, I think there, or as a supplement perhaps, there may be a need to say there is something more sophisticated, wiser, more technologically advanced. And it seems to me that uh, uh, this is a reasonable supplement to say as a substitute for religious beliefs per se. Our needs are so great emotionally for some kind of religious center and our fears, our paranoid fears are so great that it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult to look at this objectively and yet that's what we must do. Every era has had its extraterrestrials, except we now have a language that allows them to be extraterrestrial beings instead of previous eras when they were just strange beings. If all the skeptical scientists in the world would put their heads together just for one year and do an in-depth study of this phenomenon to find out whether or not UFOs are extraterrestrial in nature, maybe we could come up with some answers instead of being criticized all the time as to whether or not this is a true science. Somehow we as scientists have failed in explaining to people that there are things about the universe that we really do understand. We don't know everything, but we know a lot. And there are things that we can just rule out and uh, people just don't buy this. Um, and I find that very sad, that, that the, the culture of modern science has not really sunk in in the culture of our nation. Bud Hopkins believes that if modern science would not completely rule out UFO claims, if they would just investigate a fraction of these sightings, they would indeed reach a larger audience. What I like to say is that an extraordinary phenomenon which this undeniably is, no matter what your point of view is about it. An extraordinary phenomenon demands an extraordinary investigation. The way science works is that if there were something out there that was credible, if there was real good evidence and things could be, could be followed up and said, yes, in fact, I see what you're talking about, people would love that. If there was anything to it, it would be embraced by the scientific community. Though skeptics will insist that all the thousands of claims of alien sightings do not add up to a single scientific confirmation, people will go on reporting them, asserting with equal fervor that what they saw was real. But without physical evidence, we are left only with assumptions. Some choose to believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life rather than tolerate the uncertainty of the unexplained.